Welcome back. Welcome back to the second half of second day convention. All right. So uh, before we start, so please ensure that the handphone are switched off. All right. Okay. So today the topic is Kan Yu Di Solution. Well, I'm going. I just wondering how am I going to introduce the speaker from Australia? He is a Feng Shui master and he is also a Kung Fu master and he is also a TCM doctor. Okay. So I don't know how I'm going to introduce him, but however, today he will be sharing about on selecting the auspicious day. Master Tyler, please come on stage. Thank you. Okay, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, date selection, but as uh, Master Guo mentioned, uh, my lens is as a Chinese doctor, so I look at feng shui through having started uh, as a Chinese doctor, then coming to feng shui a little later, um, a little over 20 years now. Uh, I also practice Chinese martial arts, so it's another lens that I'm always looking, looking for. Uh, I practice what I refer to as the antique system of feng shui, or classical feng shui. And I'm quite specific on this because the Chinese have a very clear definition of what a classic is. A classic is a book written before or during the Han Dynasty. Now, a lot of people use the term classical feng shui. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it's not entirely correct. I think if you practice classical feng shui, for starters, you should be able to name a classical text. And the teaching does. Well, the teaching counts, but it's not a classical feng shui text. And I think most people who say they practice classical feng shui wouldn't be able to name a classical text and are practicing techniques that are not in the classical period. I think perhaps a better term would be traditional feng shui. Uh, this term is used in Chinese medicine. We have traditional Chinese medicine, and it's used in Chinese martial arts, traditional Chinese martial arts. And I think what most of us practice is traditional feng shui. Classical feng shui is a little different. Classical feng shui is heavily, he heavy emphasis on forms, but it does also include direction and configuration. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about something that falls under the uh, banner of direction today. What I'm going to be talking about today is foundational principles. Now that's not like beginner stuff, it's not basics, it's like the foundation of a home. It's like foundations in, uh, in martial arts. In martial arts I spent years drilling basic exercises to get better at the more advanced movements. We have a tendency in Feng Shui nowadays to jump straight to the really complex stuff and we get further and further removed from the simple uh, foundational principles. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Oh, so my topic, um, our, our topic for the, for the uh, convention is um, uh, ancient and, and modern science. So I, I guess I'm here arguing for the ancient side of things. Um, uh, something one of my teachers always said is that um, for every person looking into the future and looking into modern applications and research, we need, we need another person looking into the past. And to paraphrase Zhu Xi, a famous uh, Neo-Confucian philosopher, I do not want to present anything new. I merely want to give people a better understanding of what came before us. I think that's something really important. Uh, Chinese astrology and feng shui. Now, uh, for many years, I argued that Chinese astrology is not part of feng shui. Um, and I will still argue that. Now, they're definitely complementary. Um, the same as Chinese medicine and Chinese martial arts. They're all based on yin yang, uh, wu xing, uh, five elements, fa hua, eight trigrams, uh, stems, branches. They're all based on the same foundational theory. But uh, Chinese astrology is not feng shui. It's only in recent years, and in very recent years, as in 20th, 21st century, that it's become part of feng shui, or presented as part of feng shui. And I argued for a long time that no part of Chinese astrology is part of feng shui. I was wrong. And I'm going to tell you why I was wrong. Now, I wasn't wrong because people kept telling me I was wrong. I had a lot of people say, oh no, you're wrong. Chinese astrology is part of feng shui. They had no textual evidence for that. They just said that because their teacher told them. Uh, and I said, look, I need to find a textual reference. And I found this one, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. This is a quote from the Zhang Shu. Now, if you want to say you practice classical feng shui, you better know the Zhang Shu. Stephen mentioned it yesterday, Grandmaster Stephen Skinner, Master Yap Chu mentioned it today. The Zhang Shu is the burial classic. It is our grandfather text, written by our grandfather of feng shui, Wu Wu. It is the original feng shui text where all our information comes from. Everything after that is just a commentary on that text, in my opinion. People had different developments of theories, all based on that text. 
And it's called the burial classic because it applies equally to dwellings. In fact, in the text itself, it uses dwelling and burial interchangeably. And this is a quote from the uh, Zapian, the miscellaneous chapter, the final chapter, which talks mostly about uh, fun, directions. Zhangshu, chapter 3, or miscellaneous chapter. Yin and Yang in error is the first inauspicious. And this is uh, from a section called the three auspicious and the six inauspicious. Yin and Yang in error is the first inauspicious. This is talking specifically about facing directions. Okay, this is all talking about dwellings here. Year and time contrary is the second inauspicious. And this is what tweaked my interest. This is in the original Feng Shui classic. It's talking about what we would now call date selection or auspicious time. But it's talking about it in a specific context, in context of a dwelling. Not in context of, uh, is this a good day to get married? Is this a good day to cut my hair? Or is it a lucky day to put money on the races? It's specifically with, uh, in the context of dwellings. And the rest goes on uh, a few more um, of the 16 auspicious. Strength, strength small, plan large is the third inauspicious. Uh, this is talking about being overly ambitious in your building design. Depending on fortune and relying on influence is the fourth inauspicious. This is talking about being lazy in your building design and just counting on the fact that you're a good full train master and people will pay for it anyway. Uh, usurping the superior and compelling the inferior is the fifth inauspicious. This is talking about using cheap building materials on an expensive property to save money or trying to use expensive materials on a, on a cheap property to dress them up and up as land. And the last one, changing what ought to be and the strange is seen, the sixth inauspicious. It's a little obscure, this one, but it's talking about unpredictable events, um, natural disasters or you know, uh, property disputes, things that are beyond your control as the Feng Shui master, hindering your, uh, your analysis, which I'm sure it will come across. You part way through analysis and their partner walks in the room and says, I won't have this, or we ask to make a change and the neighbor says, no, no, I'm knocking down this whole fence. So it's talking about this sort of thing. It's a very practical information. And they weren't just talking about inauspicious. There is three, three auspicious points as well, which are also quite nice. The first one is about ritual, having a building ritual at the, the correct timing. The second one is about having uh, auspicious soil. And the third one, which I really have, is just about having good skill. If you don't have good skill, it's very inauspicious. So with reference to this second line, year and time contrary is the second inauspicious. So from this, we can assume that Walpole was talking about date selection. Now, he doesn't give any more information in the text about what method he used. So one of the arguments is, oh, therefore he wasn't talking about it. It's a poor argument. Um, there's certain things that we will talk about here. Now, nobody has actually mentioned what yin or yang is since we've been here. No one's mentioned what chi is since we've been here, because we all have a good understanding of that. So it's wasting time for us to sit there and talk about yin and yang is this, chi is this, the five elements of this. So there's certain implied knowledge. And in a lot of these texts, there was implied knowledge. Because you have to remember, these texts were written at a time when they were etched in bamboo. So you didn't, you didn't add a whole lot of extra text. You, you, you were very succinct. So when they say this, it's because on the assumption that people knew there was date selection methods around at that time that were being used. And he's saying they're important for Feng Shui. So we're going to have a look at what sort of uh, date selection methods were around at this time. And what, the way we're going to look at it, <clears throat> Um, I do a little bit of work in when I'm, uh, part of my work in Feng Shui is doing research. Now, it's not what is strictly called academic research. Uh, I think we can learn some great, thing from, great things from academics, but sometimes the academic model is a little too rigid and not, not completely practical for us. And also, to be honest, reading research bores the shit out of you. I can't stand reading clinical trials. I've been involved in Chinese medicine for years and I've never done a clinical trial. I find reading data and surveys incredibly boring. So I propose a, a different model for research. And what I want to do is show you a little bit about how I research, because it's something simple you could be doing yourselves. And so these are the steps I'm going to follow today. Uh, first, we have a question. Is date selection a method of feng shui? Now, when I start this, I start this not wanting to prove that. I start this with the question, finding out if it's true or false. Okay? Uh, textual evidence. We are a source-based system. Uh, anyone who tells you otherwise is uh, he's telling lies or has been lied to. We are not an oral tradition. And I think it's one of the failing points of modern feng shui when a teacher uh, or when a student says, oh, but my teacher told me it's, it's part of their lineage. It's a lineage thing. It was never written down. If it wasn't written down, it does not exist in Feng Shui. 
Now, it may have existed previously, but it does not exist now in a oral form passed down until now. There's just too many problems with passing oral things down for hundreds and thousands of years without losing information. Now, when we started, just before we started, I passed a message on up the back to Adriel. Now, does anybody have, where did the message get to? Did anybody get a message passed on to them? Over here, did you get a message passed to you? No? Did anyone here get a message passed to them? No, it didn't make it around? Very simply proves my point. Okay, what I did was I played a little game of Chinese whispers. Now, I told Adriel just a little piece of information. I said green three, blue four, white six, gold seven. Now, anyone who knows a little bit about their numbers and colours might work out that I'm potentially talking about different colours for the elements and numbers. It's not that I didn't use the standard numbers we use with the uh, Loshu diagram. That's a little bit too easy. And I passed that round. My idea being, if it got, if it got anywhere, then great. But every time I've done this, it's never made it to the front row. Now, we're a bit scattered here, so I admit that's part of the problem. Um, I did a similar presentation a few years back in Sydney, and it got all the way to the front row, and the person in the front stood up and said, green three, blue four, white, white six, gold seven. Ha! Proved you wrong. And then I asked him to please give me the piece of paper he had it written down on, because the first person had written it down and passed it around the room. And he proved that we're a written tradition. An oral tradition just does not exist. As soon as we start passing it, it breaks down. Someone doesn't get passed on, or someone gets the wrong information. Whenever I do that, it never makes it to the front row. And this is the problem with saying, oh, it's lineage. It was just an oral tradition. It was never written down. Now, there's obviously things that were written down that we haven't found yet. But passing something off as an oral tradition because you can't back it up with a textual reference is poor research and poor from training, my opinion. So we're going to be looking at sources. We're also going to look for a physical correlation, okay? Something we're actually looking at. And this is something interesting when I ask people who are practicing, whether they're practicing Bats or Zuei Doshu or Timen Dunja, what are we actually working with? Oh yeah, the stems and branches. Yeah, but what, are we actually, what actually is it? Can you show me in the world? What do you say to your clients? And the common answer again, oh, you don't have to explain this to your clients. No, but can you explain it to me? And most of us can't actually explain what it is we're working with. It's very obscure mathematics. And all these things should relate back to astronomical phenomena. We call it Chinese astrology. Actually, Chinese calendrical astrology is probably a better term. There's really calendars we're looking at. But it'd be nice to be able to relate it back to something physical. And that's what I want to look for. Something I actually see and point to and say, that's what I'm talking about. So that's, that's another thing I'm looking for today. We're going to look a little bit at the practical application and also uh, some sort of imperial verification, okay? A survey of use. So we're going to go through Oh, first, this is what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> this is called a shupan. Now, this was a popular date selection method at the time that Guo Wu wrote the Zhang Shu. And that is... Uh, that is in the Jin Dynasty he wrote it. Okay, so the Jin Dynasty is just the other side of the Han Dynasty. So by the strict sense, even that's not a classic, but it's the closest we've got to a classic. It's written immediately after the classical period. And during that time, the Shurpan was the popular method of use for date selection. Now, as you can see, it has a very familiar arrangement, the um, Tianyuan, Difan, like the circular heaven over square earth. That circular plate in the middle would be a revolving plate. And I think everyone should recognise it looks something like a Lohan. And I think a lot of people are familiar with this as uh, potentially the forerunners of the Lohan. Um, I refer to it as a divination plate. It's also called a cosmic board, a cosmograph. Um, a, what are some of the other names? Um, there's some hilarious names from some of the um, academics. Uh, a Mantic Astrolab, which I have no idea what that actually means, but that's apparently a term for this. Um, so as I said, it's often called the forerunner of the Shurpan. It has a few details on it. They're a little hard to see, but I've got some better diagrams later. We have first the heaven plate in the centre. On the heaven plate, we have the 12 months as numerals, or sometimes the 12... Um, monthly general spirits, okay, which just represent the 12 months. We also have the 28 uh, xiao, the asterisms, or the lunar lodges, um, uh, 28 lunar mansions is the other term, and they are written anti-clockwise, so they're described as, as uh, circling right, so if you start at the bottom, you move to the right, anti-clockwise. And that is because when we use the shurpan, we actually turn it clockwise. Now, if you imagine a clock, if I've got a clock up on the wall, now the hands turn on a clock, Imagine the hand stay still, and I now turn the clock. If I turn my clock clockwise, time goes backwards, <coughs> if you follow me. 
So in order to move the clock round, I actually have to have the numbers count backwards. And that's why the, that's why the constellations are backwards on the, uh, on the circular plate, the shrupa. Uh, on the earth plate, the square plate, we have the heavenly stems, the tiangang, uh, the earthly branches, the dija, and also the 28 lunar mansions, again, anti-clockwise for the lunar mansions, but clockwise for the other ones. Um, these were often made of uh, lacquered wood, bronze, ivory, jade. Now, another thing that um, I found interesting, there's quite a few academics who talk about these, and they always comment on the fact that the dipper, the dipper isn't very well drawn here, the dipper's here, okay, these are these dots, you'll see it better on another diagram coming up. But they comment that the dipper is not drawn as I see it in the sky. And the, way, the easy way to remember is, the dipper or the ladle is a spoon. In the sky, it's a spoon you would be holding in your left hand, okay, it looks like a left hand spoon. But on the divination plate, on the shurpan, it is a right-hand spoon. It's as seen from above. And there's all these explanations as to why it's mirrored on there. Oh, it's because it's as viewed by the gods and all this sort of thing. No, it's for a very practical, simple reason. The handle of the dipper is what we're going to use to give us our orientation. Now, if I'm looking at the dipper in the sky, it's going to point in a direction. And if I take that, if I take that image and I put it down onto a plate, I now have to hold that above my head to use it, which is not very practical. So what do we do? We take that image and we we don't turn it over, we put it down on top so it is the mirror image. So we can use it this way. Now if you're happy to crane your neck, you can have one the other way and do it this way. But this is why they are mirrored on the Shurpan. Um, and this is also a symbolic arrangement of the heavens because the 28 mansions, each of them has a different number of degrees. Some of the mansions are very big, they have I think uh, wings in the um, mansion of the bird has 22 stars, and there's other mansions like Trias that only have three stars. So they have unequal widths around the celestial equator. On the device, they're equally spaced. And also on the device, the dipper is in the middle. In reality, in the sky, the dipper, the first two stars of the dipper, point to the pole star. So it's not actually in the middle, the pole star is in the middle. But for the purpose of this device, it's symbolic, we put the dipper right in the middle. So this is the device we're going to look at. And we're going to look at a few quotes from uh, different texts. And this is going to tell us what we need to know about the Dipper. Now, we don't need to go into a lot of detail about these texts. And as I said, I'm going to take a look at about the method so you understand how I did this. Now, I've done my own translations, but none of these texts that I've used are not already translated in English. And in fact, most of these texts right here, you can find if you pick up Grandmaster Stephen Skinner's Compass Manual, and open up the page on the Shurpan, you can find these same quotes. Okay, I've found a few others, but most of the same quotes. And if you go into his reference section in the back, you'll see where he got the quotes. And that's my process. I look at a text, I find where they got their references, I go to that text, I find their references, and we get as close as we can to the original quotes. So there's uh, seven different quotes we're going to look at here, from the Tao Te Ching. Um, some people will probably know it as the Tao Te Ching, which is mispronunciation. That's the way Giles lettering, but the way Giles lettering is still meant to be pronounced Dao De Jin, not Tao Te Ching, but it's the Dao De Jin. Uh, the Shangshu, the documents book, or the esteemed documents, attributed to uh, Kongzi, Confucius. Uh, Chu Tzu, uh, which is uh, the southern verses, a particular poem from the southern verses, is relevant. Uh, the Zhou Li, the rites of Zhou. Uh, the Huainanzi, master south of the river. Uh, the Shiji, the historic record, and the last one is the Hanshu, the Book of Han. Now that is the book about everything that happened in the Han Dynasty, so obviously it was written a little bit after the Han Dynasty, but we still classify it as a classic because it's about the Han Dynasty. First quote. <clears throat> now, the first quote, probably not talking, of talking about a Shurpan, but a few people mention it, so I put it up there. This is from the Dao De Jing. Therefore the sage embraces oneness and uses it as a Shur all under heaven. Now, it could be suggesting that the sage is embracing oneness, or one does that, and uses that <coughs> as the shurpan. It's probably more, more likely suggesting that they're using it as a model. The term shur can also mean model. So they embrace oneness and use it as a model for all of heaven. So what they're saying is we're trying to align ourselves with heaven. Now that could be physically aligning a shurpan with heaven. It's probably more likely uh, aligning yourself with the heaven. So this one probably isn't about the shurpan. The next one we have here, uh, this is from the Shangshu, and this is talking about uh, the Emperor Shun. Shun consulted the rotating arm mill. It's not a great translation, it's the best I could come up with. Uh, it's these two characters here, which is Xuanji. Uh, Xuanji is something which revolves, 
Schwein is to revolve, and G is a device used for, for um, purposes of astronomical calculations that has rings in it. And that is what an armor is, uh, a device that has rings in it. So we have like armor and spheres, which is like a globe of the cosmos. This is a rotating armor with the J measure. The J measure is another term for the Dipper, the Northern Dipper constellation. So the Emperor consults the rotating arm on the J measure, the Shu. He consults his Shu arm to order to, in order to regulate the seven affairs. The seven affairs are the four seasons, the patterns of the heavens, the oh, sorry, the images of the heavens, the patterns of the earth, and the affairs of mankind. So he's using his Shu arm to regulate what's going on in the seasons and in our lives. So this is pretty confidently talking about a Shu arm. Next one. This is a long one. Um, this is from uh, a very famous poem called um, Tianwen, Questions to Heaven. And for a long time, for the longest time, people have assumed this was the, the poem of a raving madman who was yelling at heaven saying, why, why do you do this, heaven? What is going on? And arguing with some uh, mythical creator, some mythical god who created heaven. And so it's always been analysed in that sense of, oh, he's asking heaven questions. He's asking who created the heavens. There's one interesting researcher, um, Dr. Stephen Field, um, from um, Trinity, New Mexico. Um, and he's a feng shui researcher, also does a little bit of practice in feng shui. He has a slightly different take on it, which I think is very interesting. He said, if you read this again and think about it as describing a shu, like a shu pan, a divination plate, suddenly it takes on a different, a little different aspect. I actually think it's both. I think it's written in such a clever way, like a lot of classics, that it could be referring to asking questions about the heaven or asking questions about a physical device as well. The round pattern was manifold, uh, manifold, many layers, multiple layers. Who devised and calibrated it? It already sounds like a device. What an achievement that was. Who first fashioned it? Where are the revolving cords tied? The revolving cords are the uh, the Arshan. Uh, the Arshan are two cords, and they are north, south, east, west. So from Wu uh, Zi, uh, so uh, I'll do animals, um, horse to rat, Mao uh, Yol, like the rabbit to uh, rooster. So the cords. So that's the, we'd say the cords of heaven, like the, the ways the ways to sort of divide the heavens. It's also what we do on our lopan. We put two cords on a lopan. Okay, now they probably weren't on the shurpan. But the idea is these, these are the cords of heaven, and that's what the cords on Lopan represent, is their Roshan, the cords of heaven. Uh, where are the revolving cords tied? Where is the celestial pole raised, as in the, the pole star? Uh, where is it? Well, we just said, it's in the middle of the Shurpan in this case. Uh, where are the eight pillars based? Why is the southeast deficient? Uh, this goes back to an old story of two giants who were fighting, uh, it's a sort of a mythological creation story of China. Uh, two giants were fighting, uh, Zhu Rong and Wu Mang, I think are the names, and uh, they were fighting in the northwest and they knocked over one of the eight pillars that held up heaven. And when they knocked the pillar over, the sky fell down towards the northwest. Now, the way we would probably look at it from our point of view is the land is higher in the northwest. That's where all the mountains are in China, that's the Tibetan plateau. But the Chinese look at it and say, look, there's, there's not much sky there. Like, it's, there's, there's much more land there. Like, this, the, land's, the, the sky is less, the land's bigger. Uh, why is the southeast efficient? As in, why doesn't the southeast have enough land to fill up towards the sky? It's all it's tilted towards the north because the giants knocked over the pillar. Uh, where are the borders in the nine heavens, and where do they connect? Numerous are their corners and bends. Who knows how many? This is talking about how we draw constellations, and we do this in the west as well. We do dots and we join them together with lines, and we make pictures out of that. How do the heavens mesh, and where are the twelve divisions? The twelve divisions are the twelve earthly branches. Where is the conjunction, conjunction of the sun and the moon, and how are the pattern stars arrayed? The conjunction of the sun and the moon is actually the 12 earthly branches. And anyone who saw last year I was talking about that is the original meaning of our 12 earthly branches are the conjunction of the sun and the moon, which happens 12 times a year. Well, it's actually a new moon when the sun and the moon are in, are in alignment. Uh, heaven's shirt sure, has lengthwise and crosswise. So the divination plate has lengthwise and crosswise. I keep doing this. I'm going to grab my... This is my travel shurpan because I made a beautiful wooden shurpan. I was telling Stephen the story over lunch, and I made this beautiful wooden shurpan, and I made two because I wanted to take one as a gift to China, and I made another one for me to bring back. And when I came back, Australian customs said, "You can't bring that into Australia. It's timber, and it came from China." 
And I said, no, it came from bunnies, and I made it myself. And they said, no, no, it's clearly got Chinese characters, it was made in China. And they seized it and offered to treat it and put it in quarantine and for a fee I could get it back later. So I chose this time to bring one that I made out of uh, laminated paper. Uh, and you can do the same yourself. Uh, page 409 of Stephen's text, the compass text, he gives permission, so that's why I can do this, to photocopy the page and make your own true poem from it with a split pin. It's really easy to do. So this is what I'm talking about. This is the size of the original, one of the original Shurpana. This particular one is my favourite of the seven that have been found. It's often called the, the dipper plate because it's um, mostly, it's pretty simple. It's just the dipper, the months in numbers, which makes it so easy for us when you just count the numbers around instead of having to work out which gem was which month. Um, and that's the actual dimensions. And this one was found buried. Uh, it was buried in 165 BC in Anhui. Anhui was very famous for Lopan construction. Uh, up until current day, so that was kind of nice that was the one found in Arnhem. Um, and the Shura has lengthwise and crosswise. It has two dimensions, okay? It's flat and it has lengthwise and crosswise. Okay, next quote. More textual evidence. The Grand Analyst. Now the Grand Analyst was uh, something like the, um, the Royal Astronomer. Uh, the Grand Analyst rectified the lunar solar calendar Announced the beginning of the month, informs the emperor of the intercalary months in order to sit in the gate. The emperor was always scared of the intercalary month, he had to stay inside. Uh, performs divination, reads rites, details the funeral. When there is a major change in the capital, he takes the plan and studies it in advance. Okay? The Dashu, the grand analyst, was a feng shui practitioner. He studied the plans for the, for the new uh, capital and made decisions based on that. Now, the quote is, when there is a great army, he carries the times of heaven, and he rides in the same chariot as the Grand Master. Uh, the Grand Master in this case refers to the Grand Master of Music, which everyone should know who was born in the, or who, who grew up through the 70s and 80s, is Grand Master Flash, the original rapper. He is the Grand Master of Music. Um, now, the, the little sub-quote that goes with this, Dashu, Ba Shu Yi, Zhi Tian Shu. He takes care of the shu, the divination plate, in order to ascertain the times of heaven. So they were talking about here that his job was to carry around the shu, and in this case, it would have been for military strategy to work out where they were going to go, which, which angle is the dipper point in. Uh, down the bottom here, another quote. <clears throat> this is from the White Nanza. Uh, we're almost finished the quotes now. Uh, the northern dipper spirit has masculine and feminine. Now remember, masculine relates to heaven, circular. Feminine relates to square, earth. In the eleventh month, they in, in the eleventh month at the beginning, they establish in Zi, the rat. Each month they go through one chronogram or one uh, earthly branch. The masculine moves left. And I can do it here for you. This one's gonna move left. Now where are we? The masculine's gonna move to the left. Now the left is clockwise. Start at the bottom, left, left is clockwise. So my masculine is moving left, it's moving clockwise. And the feminine moves right, so moving this way. Uh, and then it just goes on to say that at summer solstice, they, they unite to plan punishment, as in the beginning of winter is going to be coming. In the eleventh month, in the in the summer solstice, in the winter solstice, they unite to plan virtue, flourishing. Uh, tai Yin, Tai Yin in this case is used interchangeably. Tai Yin, Sui Yin, Tai Sui, and Tai Sui is probably the one that most people know. Okay, Tai Yin, Sui Yin, Tai Sui, interchangeable terms. Tai Sui, which everyone calls the Grand Duke. Can I take a little aside rant here for just a moment? The Grand Duke makes no sense at all. Tai Sui does not mean Duke in any way, shape or form. Whoever came up with it, I don't know. It's terrible. Tai Sui means the great year or the grand year. But for some reason, we go with Grand Duke. And we also go with Poison Arrows, which if I'm gonna rant, I might as well hit that one as well, because Sha Chi says nothing about arrows. There's no word for arrow in there. It doesn't even say poison. Sha is death, evil, or uh, killing and cheese, cheese. So I don't know why we call it poison arrows. Um, there's more, but I won't. Yeah, I, <laughs> there's too many terms that upset me, so I'll, I'll leave those. I won't keep going. Um, so here we have uh, when Tai when the Tai Sui dwells in a chronogram that is a dislikable day. So when it's uh, when it dwells in a uh, an earthly branch that's dislikable. Uh, on a dislikable day is when one cannot take up the hundred affairs. The canopy and chariot, which is the other term for the shurpan, canopy, round, chariot, square, is slowly moved. The masculine knows the tone of the feminine. Okay, so they, they work in unison. What this is talking about here is saying that you know, if it points in certain directions, 
it's a dislikable day, don't do things, okay? Same sort of thing we do with date, date selection. Don't wash your hair on this day, don't go to the movies this day, this sort of thing. <clears throat> uh, so that the last two quotes, I think. Um, from the Shruti, the uh, historical records. Uh, the seven stars of the Northern Dipper, they are called they, the so-called rotating armor with its changed me measure in order to regulate the seven affairs. We saw that quote earlier. This is quoting an earlier quote. The label leads to the dragon's head, and this is describing the position of the dipper on here. The label leads to the dragon head, so the handle points to, uh, sorry, to the dragon's horn. The handle points to the asterism horn. The measure, the jade measure, which is also the fifth star, is abundant at the southern dipper. It sits over the constellation southern dipper. And the bowl rests upon triaster, so the bowl of the dipper sits on the head of another constellation triaster. It's just describing its positioning, so it's pretty clearly, that's not the way it positions in the sky, because the dipper moves in the sky all the time. It's describing a fixed position, it's describing it how it appears on the device. Uh, last quote, nowadays the diviners, they have methods for heaven and earth, in the image of the four seasons, following benevolence and righteousness. They divide the strips to establish the trigrams. They turn the shirt to rectify the board. Thereafter, they can speak of the advantages and disadvantages of heaven and earth, the success or failure of human affairs. This is talking more directly about just using the shirt plan to determine what we're going to do. Oh, sorry, that's not the last quote. This, this is sort of two, I guess, uh, classical case studies. Uh, the first one is uh, an emperor had a dream in the middle of the night, summoned the, the royal, the, the royal, the court astronomer, send him in, interpret my dream for me. Uh, Wei Ping, this is the uh, imperial astronomer, then held up the shu, the shu pan, the divination plate. Looking up to heaven to examine the moonlight, he observed where the dipper was pointing and established the place the sun was residing. So he orientated the shu pan. He used the compass and square for assistance. Now this is a compass not as in a uh, magnetic compass, this is a compass as in, as in a drafting compass. Okay, so two points. Uh, the compass and square for assistance along with the weight and measure. So he set his shu pan up and he used a square, and he used a compass, and he orientated it correctly, much like what is practiced nowadays with modern surveying. Okay? He made sure it was aligned correctly and level. When the four ropes were fixed, the eight trigrams faced one another, he observed its auspiciousness and inauspiciousness. The first portent to appear was the insect. So he measured it, looked at it, and he came up with the insect. Now, I can't explain what the insect means, but that's, that's what he found, and was able to talk to the emperor about it. Uh, the last one is a famous story. In the middle of the Han Dynasty, uh, there was an, a, a usurper, a usurper called um, uh, King Wang, Wang Mang. And um, King Mang uh, decided to establish a new dynasty. He didn't do very well. And at this point, he's being attacked by the rebellion. He's hidden in the back of the palace. And it says, he dressed himself in dark purple with a silk belt, holding the imperial seal and the dagger of the emperor Yu, Da Yu, one of the, the first emperor of China, so a symbolic dagger. The official astronomer placed a shur, a shur pan in front of him. He entered the particular day and time. Mum turned his seat to follow the dipper handle and sat saying, Heaven has created virtue in me. What can the Han armies do to me? So he aligned himself to the dipper. One of the other terms of the dipper, you'll see in the next image, is the chariot of the emperor, like celestial chariot. So he sat facing the same way as the, the dipper and said, I, I'm aligned with the heavens, who can stop me? Turns out a commoner could because they raided the palace and he got stabbed in the back of his palace by a common soldier. So it didn't work very well for him. He didn't know how to use it properly. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, here we have, this is the image here of the uh, Dipper as, uh, as the celestial chariot, uh, the chariot of the emperor. The Dipper serves as the emperor's chariot. Moving at the centre, it overlooks and controls the four counties, divides yin yang, establishes the four seasons, equalises the five elements, shifts the seasonal nodes, the jianqi, and the day degrees, the du, and sets the various arrangements, all are connected to the dipper. So all these things are what the dipper does. It sounds fairly important. Now, if there's one constellation that you should learn, if you're practicing feng shui, it is the northern dipper. It is the single most important constellation in feng shui. And this basically appears as a giant clock in the sky. The first two stars, when connected up, will point north, but the handle of the dipper, at different times of the year, will indicate what season it is. And this is our next quote. This is talking about, this is from the Laguanza, uh, Master Pheasant Catch Classic. When the dipper handle points east, all under heaven is spring. When the dipper handle points south, all under heaven is summer. When the dipper handle points west, all under heaven is autumn. When the dipper handle points north, all under heaven is winter. So this is where we get our directions associated to 
uh, to the seasons and to the elements. You know, and years ago, I remember a student asked me, why does the East relate to wood? And this was a Chinese medicine student, and I didn't have an answer. And then I came to Feng Shui, and I thought, oh, someone in Feng Shui will know. Why does the East relate to wood? Oh, that's the correlation, the East relates to wood. Why? Why doesn't East relate to fire or something else? And like, we all know our directions. We, we know that wood is east and that metal is west, but this is where it comes from. It comes from the orientation of the Northern Dipper. This is the origin for all our directional uh, practices in Feng Shui. And here's how it looks. So here's a picture of it. This is this one, blown up. And if we look here, in spring, the handle is gonna point east. When we turn it around in summer, it's going to point south, south at the top. So it's pointing towards uh, ooh, the horse. <laughs> Here to east, the uh, Mount Rabbit. Now, this is at midnight on the equinox and the solstice because the dipper actually turns around in the sky like a giant clock. It turns around all the time. But if you look at it at midnight at certain times, you can get a direction from it. If we go to the next two, we've got autumn, it's pointing west to Yol, uh, the rabbit, and in winter, it's pointing north to Zi. Now, if you were to get out and look at the Northern Dipper. You have to be in the Northern, Hem Northern Hemisphere for it. But if you go out and look at the Dipper, on midnight, on the winter solstice, it will point to Zi. And if you then follow it, every two hours, it will tick to a different one of the 12 earthly branches. It'll count through the 12 hours. And that's why the earthly branches indicate months and also hours. So it's a giant clock hand in the sky. In the sky. It'll tell us hours, but it'll also tell us seasons as well. Very significant. Now we do use this. Most people don't realise you're using this all the time when you do feng shui. You're just not aware of what it came from. So let's have a look here. Over here, this is the Tai Sui for this year. Uh, this is from the Shanghai Jin, which is one of my favourite classics, the Mountain and Seas classic. It's an early geography book. Uh, it talks a lot about feng shui because the person who edited, edited, edited it and did the most commentaries on it was Gorpu, which you may remember is our grandfather of Feng Shui. So he did a great commentary on this. And it says, Everything on earth, united amongst the six spaces, forwards, backwards, left, right, up and down, within the four seas, illuminated by the sun and the moon, takes the stars as the weft, okay, the horizontal, is arranged by the four seasons, and uses the Tai Sui as the most essential. You notice here I can say Grand Duke, I said Tai Sui. We, we all know Tai Sui, we can just use Tai Sui. Or if you want to, Great Year. Uses the Great Year as the most essential. The gods created these, such things have different forms, perhaps dying young, or perhaps living a long life. Only the sage has the ability to connect this to the way. So if you're sagely, you know how to use the Tai Sui, because it's really important. And this is something I think is significant uh, in Feng Shui. Now we have lots of different methods of date selection. Some people use Baozi, some people use the uh, Tianqian, like the 12, um, uh, the 12, I translate hmm? Yeah, the 12 officials, yeah, the 12 officials, or Qimen Dunja, or all these different methods. And everyone disagrees on their interpretation. Everyone has a different opinion on how it works and what it does. And they're very obscure mathematical. One thing that, without a doubt, everyone agrees on is the use of the Tai Sui. No one's ever had a different opinion on the Tai Sui that I've found. Everybody says the same thing. And I think, hopefully, everyone knows how we use the Tai Sui. We'll get to that in a moment. But the Tai Sui, very important. We all agree on it. And we all say it's important. So if we all agree on important, that's just a win-win in my case. Because I don't have to argue with somebody else. If everyone agrees on how to use the same. And of the four grand masters we have, they all in written, I've checked all of them in written versions have said the same thing. They're all in agreement. I believe we're all in agreement with this. Here's how we use it. Now remember, the dipper was the heavenly chariot. It was the chariot of the emperor in heaven. Now, this is a quote from the Lichi, the, uh, the Record of Rites. In the second month of summer, the son of heaven, the emperor, dwells in the Ming Tang of the ancestral temple. Now, let me explain this. The Ming Tang, we talk about the Ming Tang as being the front of a, uh, of a dwelling. Originally, Ming Tang described the whole dwelling. Originally, Ming Tang actually described the temple. This is the Ming Tang temple. And the temple had nine rooms in it. And the front room of the Ming Tang was called the Ming Tang. So, the Ming Tang of the Ming Tang. Now we can appreciate that because it's the front. We know what the front is. And the front would face which direction? South. Okay. So in the second month of summer, okay, so the middle of summer, summer solstice, the Son of Heaven dwells in the Ming Tang of the Ancestral Temple. So in the second month of summer, he sits 
facing south, which means he's sitting in the same seat as the emperor. He's sitting in the dipper, facing the same way as the handle. Okay, so he's facing the direction of the Tai Sui. Now, for anyone who uses Tai Sui, that's the opposite to how we use it. We don't face the Tai Sui. We put our back to the Tai Sui. And that's what the next quote tells us. This is from the Huan Anza. To face the Tai Sui is to be humiliated. To back it is to be strong. The left is declining, the right is prosperous. One cannot face it, but one cannot face it. Can back it, cannot be left, can be right. This is its meaning, okay? It, it sounds quite complex, but what we're saying is, as I think everybody knows, hopefully everyone knows, you put your back to the Tai Sui, okay? To the great year, okay? You don't face the Tai Sui. And this is the reason why, and this is why King Wang, why Mung, Wang Mung failed. He said, I'm the son of heaven, I'm the rightful emperor. So he sat facing the same way as the Tai Sui. The only person that should do that is the heavenly emperor. Now, if you sit facing the Tai Sui, you are doing this. Now, let's say I'm the, let's say I'm the emperor, okay? I'm the heavenly emperor in this room, so I'm sitting in the front. Okay, if you sit facing the same direction as me, that means you have your back to me, or you're sitting behind me. If you back, and I'm looking this way, let's say this is the Tai Sui, if you sit with your back to the Tai Sui, you're facing the emperor. It's the correct heavenly alignment. So that's why we put our back to the Tai Sui. We, we put our back to it, so we're facing towards the emperor. We're not claiming to be the emperor. He's the only one that can face the Tai Sui. He does that here in the temple. He faces the Tai Sui because he's strong enough. He's aligned with heaven. We all put our back to the Tai Sui. And this is how most people use the Tai Sui. I think most people don't realize it comes from the handle of the dipper. We're actually choosing this great big heavenly clock in the sky. I and mean, this is kind of, it's, think of this as huge. This huge clock in the sky. And its handle is pointing and indicating the season. It's kind of hard to miss. I mean, if you're, if you're looking up at the heavens, which they did, because they didn't have Netflix and stuff, they didn't sit around and play with apps on their phone, and they looked up at the skies at night, and when you see this giant handle pointing different directions at night, it's pretty significant, okay? And it's become one of my most significant theories in Feng Shui. It's become the Tai Sui. Now, the only way we use the Tai Sui is by the year, though. Now, from the Shu Pan, we can actually use it in a lot of different ways. We don't just use it by the year. We know, if we go back a little bit, that points different directions in different seasons. So you don't have to just use the Tai Sui of the year, you can use the Tai Sui of the month. Now, technically then it's not the Tai Sui, because Tai Sui means the great year, but then we're talking about the Dipper. So you can use the Dipper to find the inauspicious direction for the year, the Tai Sui, or you can use the Dipper to find the inauspicious direction for a season, which is here, or for a month, or even for an hour. Now that's probably a little bit too much detail. We have a tendency in Feng Shui to go more complex, more detail is better. Not necessarily. Sometimes simple is better. And this is a really simple way of putting auspicious timing. Attached to direction. I can't use this and go, should I wash my hair tonight? Magic low pan, magic sure pan says no. No, it doesn't work like that. Okay? It gives me a direction. It tells me, and I don't think everyone knows how we use the Tai Sui, what direction not to build in, what direction not to move the earth in, whatever interpretation you have of that. But then you can use this now. Because you realise it's now actually something physical in the sky, it's the dipper. Now I'm not saying go out there and look at the dipper because I'm not really good. I get there and go, uh, I, I do um, textual astronomy, okay? I'm learning astronomy and looking at the stars, but I still look at things and go, but, uh, oh, that's on the stuff, I can't even see that in the southern hemisphere, so I have to look in a planetarium. And, but um, you don't need to go and look at the dipper. You can use lookup tables, or as I said, in Stephen's book, he gives directions on how to do this, and you can print it out and make it. I like this one because it's really simple. I know my numbers in Chinese, I just go uh, in the fifth month, line fifth up with, with Yo, and it gives me the direction, the handle, the dipper, and I know that is the, I guess, like the mini Tai Sui of the month. And I think it's the sort of thing we should be looking at when we're arguing all these different methods and different interpretations of them. When there's something that we all agree on, we really should embrace it, and it makes it particularly important in our practice. Um, that's about all I've got to say on the Shrupan. You can use the Shrupan to calculate all sorts of different things. There is ritual methods where they have rituals involved in it. There's ways to calculate the different uh, lunar mansions. This is a really simple, easy method. But as I said, go to page 409 in Stephen's manual and you can see in detail how to do it very easily. Print one out and do it. Or you can just use lookup tables. So um, I haven't done any yet, but I'm going to put a table together that just says which direction it points each month. And then you know like your mini Thai sway of the month or like the Thai the great month. I'll, I'll come up with a good term for it. But this was the way the strip was used uh, originally in the classical method.
And as I said, as I promised, that is a list of all the texts I used. Now, I didn't translate any of those myself. I retranslated them, and all those references you can find in Stephen's book. He references texts that reference these texts, so you just follow the chain. It's, it's, it's Googling, it's research. Uh, it's a very simple way to do it. Uh, it's very difficult to try and uh, do a trial for this. I thought about trying to find a way to make it like a clinical trial to work out if the Tice way really worked, but there's too many other factors going on, so it's very hard to isolate. I'd have to get 20 homes and build them against the Tice way and 20 homes and build them with the Tice way and eliminate all other factors, and I just didn't have the cash to do that, so I put it aside from work. But if anyone comes up with a good trial, let me know. Thank you very much. Wow, oh, very comprehensive information. Okay. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, uh, Master Kinder, for the information sharing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.